Welcome on March 8th to the Picture Language Seminar. We're really pleased today to have Tom Spencer. He's at Princeton, very old friend. We uh, worked maybe some 47 years ago on symmetry breaking and quantum field theory and gave mathematical proof with Jim Clem. And I came across a couple of days ago in the attic an old picture with Tom uh, in Princeton in 1987. And here you can see Tom at a dinner in Princeton with Elliot Lieb and Walter Turing and Arthur Whiteman and John Mather. But today we're going to hear about continuous symmetry breaking along the Nishimori line. And Tom, we're looking forward very much to your talk. And why don't you share your screen and get started? Okay, Arthur, thank you very much. Uh, it's uh, indeed an honor uh, to be speaking in your seminar. And let me see if I can uh, share my screen here. Uh, now, let's see. I, uh, how do I share the screen? Let's see, I have it here. On the bottom of your screen, there's an icon. Oh, okay. So let me see. Oh, yes. All right. Let me try this. Uh, there we are. So how's that? Can you see something there? Perfect. Uh, okay. And let's see what else I can do here. Uh, command, uh, command plus. And okay. Um, so uh, thanks again, Arthur. Uh, uh, for the invitation. Uh, my talk today will be about classical spin systems with continuous symmetry. And uh, we'll see that it's motivated by work on information recovery, uh, uh, particularly uh, what's called group synchronization. And um, now I don't know much about these group synchronizations, uh, but I'm starting to learn. And if there are some experts in the audience, um, uh, your comment will be particularly helpful. This is joint work, as you can see here, with uh, Christophe Garbon from the University of Lyon. And um, uh, so this work really arose out of some discussions we were having with Christophe about his paper with uh, Sepulveda on the reconstruction of the two-dimensional free field, uh, uh, given information about the discrete height model. And uh, this is related to Kostler's thalus. So then we went to explore other areas of, of, of this uh, topic and, uh, and we'll see that it's very closely related to what I'm gonna say today. So this will be, I hope, a fairly leisurely talk. Uh, please feel free to uh, interrupt, ask questions um, and uh, make comments. So let me begin by giving you a general overview. Um, so, uh, so this, these are the main results and, uh, and uh, some background. So we're uh, offering a new proof of phase transitions for three-dimensional disordered spin systems with continuous symmetry. Uh, reflection positivity is not used here, so it's really a, quite a different approach. Uh, the spin systems that we will be considering are of a particular type, which uh, first, of all, uh, they're group valued. And uh, so they're indexed by a lattice. So we're looking at in, in general D dimensions. And uh, so the groups, for example, can be um, Z2, which would be an icing type system, or they can be uh, a U1 or O2 uh, rotationally invariant model. That would be like the XY or the plane rotator model, or they can have an SU2 symmetry, which is of course not abelian. And these are the most uh, challenging ones to work with from our perspective. And these are Heisenberg type uh, models, um, which uh, we'll be uh, also discussing. So uh, the Nishimori disorder will play a very important role here. It is a special temperature dependent uh, gauge invariant disorder. And this, it, it gives you some quenched randomness in your system. And uh, so 
So uh, that's what we mean by uh, symmetry breaking along the Nishimori line. We, we will have to have, for the most part, we will rely on the Nishimori disorder to prove long range order or to prove symmetry breaking. So the main message, which is a little surprising, is that the Nishimori disorder can make it easier to prove long range order or spin alignment at long distances. So, uh, so we'll come to these precise definitions a little later, uh, but let me first uh, uh, give you some background uh, and about how uh, we came to this uh, analysis that, uh, that Christoph and I did. So, um, so the background of the proof, it really uh, it goes back to this work on group synchronization on grids. This appeared in mathematical statistics and learning. So this is the key uh, element of our proof. The, I, most of the ideas uh, really come from this uh, paper. Uh, and um, so uh, it, this is a fairly recent paper, 2018. And um, we finally realized that they had proved something uh, that we did not know how to prove uh, with the, the sort of standard methods. Um, so then the other important uh, reference to mention here is uh, Nishimori's original paper, uh, which is for the Ising model, but you can extend it as these authors uh, here have, George and company did in 85. So Nishimori initially did it for the uh, random bond easing model, and then uh, uh, George uh, and, and company in 85 did it uh, for uh, more general uh, groups. Uh, and then finally, there's a book by Nishimori uh, on, on spin glasses and statistical physics and information processing. Uh, this, is a, this is a book I should really uh, take a, a more serious look at because it certainly uh, suggests many other problems in the field. So uh, now let me continue a little bit about this problem with what they call synchronization. As I said, I don't know so much about this, but there's a paper by Amit Singer. He's also uh, Abe and, and Alan Sly and Amit Singer are all at the, uh, I think Abe's now moved uh, away, but uh, they were all at Princeton University. And in fact, I think I heard Singer's talk around this around 2011 or maybe a little earlier where he talked about this uh, synchronization. And I simply didn't realize that uh, he was talking about phase transitions for continuous symmetry. But roughly speaking, that's what he was talking about at the time. So this is called angular synchronization. And uh, so here's the setup. Given a graph with n vertices, uh, let's say indexed by, by uh, j, and you have edges, j, j prime. So JJ prime will always represent nearest neighbor edges or edges of the graph. And you have phases. Uh, you have some, some phases are in the system that you want to understand. And here's the angular synchronization problem. Determine the phases from noisy information of noisy differences of, of adjacent sites. So you know the relative angle for a certain set of adjacent sites, adjacent differences, mod two pi, and you want to recover uh, the rest of the signal. So how many, uh, how many, uh, how many such differences do you need? Uh, um, and how much noise can you allow to, uh, so that you can recover useful information about the rest of the system? So obviously, if the noise is too big and you or you have too too few differences that you're sampling, you can't get useful information. But there's a threshold. So how does it depend upon the graph? Uh, when the noise is very small, perhaps you can do it. And uh, the other uh, interesting question, from a practical point of view, is to find an algorithm to recover these uh, phases. So that's. That's sort of the background for uh, this synchronization work, which is um, behind uh, what we do too. So that's the, that is the, uh, the work that Singer uh, uh, did. And now I will come to something I'm more familiar with, which is uh, symmetry breaking. Uh, so we will look at uh, uh, ON plus one symmetry breaking. First, we'll do it without disorder. 
And then we'll come to the disordered case in, in another couple of slides. So uh, here, we're just gonna be talking about classical spins. We can suppose that they belong to um, some n-sphere and, uh, and are, are, they're indexed by a lattice or a box, by elements of a box contained in the lattice. And we define the spin-spin correlation at uh, inverse temperature beta. So this is just the usual spin-spin model. If we're their vector value, we should have a dot product here. I put the dot product up here. So we have nearest neighbor interactions and there's an inverse temperature beta that appears up here. So for those of you familiar with the easing model, this is the usual easing model, except that now my spins uh, are, not, uh, are, are not plus and minus one, but they can belong to a circle or a sphere. And, um, and the measure here that I'm integrating over, well, if I were doing easing, I would be summing over plus or minus ones. But in the case of the ON models, I'm integrating over, uh, over the sphere or uh, integrating over the circle. Or if I have a group value structure, I'll be using a harm measure. So the first thing to say is that these uh, models are, are quite rich and quite interesting. Um, uh, and, but first let's talk about two dimensions before we go to the three dimensional uh, world. So in two dimensional models um, uh, with continuous symmetry, there's a very famous theorem due to Merman and Wagner around 1966 that you cannot have continuous symmetry breaking. So what that means without getting too technical is just that the spin-spin correlations at long distances are not ordered. They just go to zero as, as, uh, as, you, as X gets very large. So that's what I will mean by, uh, by continuous symmetry breaking, that this does not go to zero, but in two dimensions, there is no continuous symmetry breaking and your spin-spin always, go always goes to zero. Now, if you're in an easing model case, then you do not have continuous symmetry and the spin-spin correlation is in two dimension is of course ordered as is well known from, uh, from Pyrrell's argument or some work of Anslager where you can get very precise information. Uh, in, for, n equals, uh, for n equals one, which is the XY model, there's a costless thalus phase, which means that this spin-spin correlation goes to zero polynomially. There's a big conjecture what happens when the spins uh, take values in the sphere, uh, the two sphere, for example. And then we believe, but there's no, no proof, unfortunately, that the spin-spin uh, correlations go to zero exponentially fast. But I, I have nothing to say about that case. So now we turn to three dimensions. Um, and uh, and uh, so this is still in the case where we have no disorder. Um, and this is a uh, work that uh, goes back quite a ways to, to Jörg Frilich and Barry Simon and myself, uh, and then later by Balaban. And it tells you that in three dimensions, there is long range order, there is continuous symmetry breaking. Uh, and the spin-spin correlations do align at long distances. And, uh, but your temperature must be um, must be quite uh, must be low enough to uh, to have it happen. If beta is uh, small, that means your temperature is high. Your spin-spin correlation always goes to zero. Uh, so there's a threshold at which the spin-spin correlation becomes ordered, and we use reflection positivity and uh, we use uh, translation invariance. Balaban develops a, a, a very important and robust multi-scale spin wave analysis, and he can prove uh, he can prove something uh, quite uh, very much the same as we do. But he has fewer; he really needs fewer assumptions on the, the structure of his interaction. In particular, he does not rely on reflection positivity. Uh, in the three-dimensional abelian case, the XY case. There are other techniques which are, uh, don't require reflection positivity. Uh, one of the first ones is due to Alan Guth, and there was later some work done by, very nice work done by Kennedy and King, which is related to what uh, I'm talking about today, although I'm not quite sure about how the relation works. Uh, anyway, that is the uh, basically a, a, a lightning summary of what happens 
for symmetry breaking when you do not have uh, any disorder. So maybe I can pause here for a minute to see whether there are comments or, or questions about the uh, case without disorder. Okay, uh, well, if not, let me uh, uh, go to the, the case which is uh, which we'll be considering for the most uh, part today, which is the disordered case. This is the phase disordered uh, XY model. Uh, there's a SU2 version of it as well. Uh, so what we're gonna do now is to consider the spin-spin correlation uh, with a XY model, but we'll introduce random phases, which will try intuitively, which they, they try to disorder the system. So these random phases I'll call omega ij, and they are, uh, they are associated to each edge of my lattice. Um, and uh, so I will define uh, this uh, disordered uh, expectation depending upon the omegas and depending upon beta. So we have a spin-spin correlation uh, uh, with, the, uh, with the angles uh, uh, theta i minus theta j, these are nearest neighbors but we have added in addition this disorder uh, omega and, uh, and our partition function uh, depends upon this disorder omega as well. So in general, the analysis of such uh, systems with uh, disorder uh, random phases present is quite difficult. Um, what we'll talk about today is a particular uh, distribution of the omega ij's in which uh, they're independent and uh, distributed according to e to the beta bar. I don't know whether you can see this beta bar. Arthur, is that visible, the bar on that? Yes, I can see it. I don't know what it means. Okay. Well, it's, it measures the amount of disorder of the omegas. So the beta, you have a beta here, which is your usual temperature. But now we have to give, a, we have to say what the disorder of the, uh, of the omegas is. And so what I'm gonna tell you is we're gonna make them independent with a weight that looks exactly like this. So if, uh, it, so for example, if beta bar were extremely large going to infinity, then the weight would be all concentrated around omega equals zero. Uh, so that's where the maximum occurs. And so that would be no disorder. If beta bar were, were infinite, there would be no disorder. If beta bar is very small, then the phases are independent and just running around the unit circle uh, with, uh, with, uh, no, um, uh, with, no, with no weights. Uh, so that would be just the uniform distribution on the circle. So the, the beta bar measures how much disorder there is in the random phases. And so the, the main point about the Nishimori, um, about the Nishimori line, which I now can uh, state, is that uh, if you there's a special disorder, and that's called the Nishimori line, in which this beta, which appears first in the uh, spin interaction, but then also appears in the disorder, these two betas have to match exactly. It looks like a replica. It, it's it's not exactly a replica. But it is, uh, we'll see how it, the magic that it performs. It's a special disorder. Uh, it's a gauge invariant disorder, uh, as we'll see. And, uh, and so, uh, so, I, so if, as I said, if beta is large, uh, if beta goes to infinity, then there's no disorder. If this beta here is large, that means we're at low temperature and we have this beta bar is small, that means we have a lot of disorder. Uh, uh, then uh, we expect a, a spin glass phase in, in three dimensions. So, so, uh, so that's what's going to happen. And I'll show you a, a picture, a phase diagram, um, maybe, in a, not, maybe not the next slide, but the slide afterwards that uh, describes the, the, this picture in a little bit more detail. And we'll see the importance of this Nishimori line. So here's our, our result with, uh, with Christoph. Uh, it says that 
if you're on the Nishimori line, in other words, these two betas match, then, then if I take the spin-spin correlation and I average over the disorder, uh, then I get a positive magnetization with an error that looks like that. And uh, so that's long range order. That's, that's, uh, uh, that's, what, uh, that's what one should expect to happen. Uh, but uh, however, uh, this is only, we can only prove this along the, the Nishimori line. Uh, this average in the uh, braces here, these rectangular brackets represents simply the disorder average over, see this depends upon the disorder. Now we average out the disorder. So we have an annealed, uh, uh, sorry, a quench system. And, uh, and the statement is that after we do this averaging, we get, uh, we get a magnetization. And, uh, and so, uh, so the result really is only valid on the Nishimori line. But Jörg uh, Frelich pointed out to us that uh, there's an inequality a message that tells you that uh, we can replace, uh, we can just make this omega equal to zero by an inequality here due to messager, miracle soul, and, and feaster that tells us that, that with this order or any disorder, you're bounded below the expectation with omega equals zero is, uh, is bounded below by, by one with this order. So that enables us to prove that in the pure case without this order, you get a uh, long range order as well. Uh, so this unfortunately will not work in the SU2 case. Now, um, we'll come back to that in a bit. The other sort of remarkable identity, which is due to Nishimori, uh, uh, at least in the easing case, the same, it works here just as well, uh, says that if I look at the spin-spin correlation uh, at long, at any distance, at any temperature, and I average, uh, I'm on the Nishimori line, of course, it's equal to the same expression with the absolute, the, the, with a square here. This is a square, which uh, it, it, when I first saw this identity, I thought, well, this can't be quite right. But, uh, but in fact, it's, it is an identity. It, it's valid for all, uh, all values of, of beta. And, uh, and it is a kind of indication that along the Nishimori line, there's no Edwards Anderson uh, parameter, which is, uh, which is being um, activated. And so, so you would never actually go, uh, although there's this order, there's not enough disorder to enter the, the spinning glass phase. So this identity, uh, of course, it can only be valid because this expectation can have negative, it can take negative values so that when I just and I average it, I, I can I can get this uh, uh, get this identity. So this that comes from the gauge invariance, which um, which I won't prove, but uh, we'll see identities very much like this, which are very important. So now I come to um, let me come to the conjectured uh, three dimensional diagram, and I'll spend a little bit of time here explaining uh, this diagram. Um, this uh, first, you have the the vertical axis. Uh, is my is my my arrow visible here? I'm not sure it is, but yeah, everything is good. Okay, good. Thank you. Uh, this is the temperature axis, and this is the disorder axis. Um, and so the so the temperature is of course beta inverse, and the disorder for uh, for, for beta. Uh, very small, the beta inverse is, is very large. So this is, this is where I have no disorder or very little disorder. Out here, I have more disorder. So this is a conjectured diagram. Um, these areas with the, where I put a P, this represents paramagnetic, and it represents the high, roughly speaking, the high temperature regime in which one can easily prove, and certainly if you have uh, beta inverse, Beta is uh, small enough, uh, um, the temperature is high enough, then, uh, then of course you can just use cluster expansions to prove uh, that you have exponential decay of correlations. And then, then along this axis here, uh, we know there's a phase transition for the XY model and for the Heisenberg model and so forth along this axis here. Uh, and there's, this is the ferromagnetic phase uh, in which you have a long range order 
which is expected to be throughout this regime, and also over here. Over here, we should uh, we expect to see the spin glass phase. This has uh, not been proved, unfortunately. Uh, it's, uh, it's still quite open, according to uh, my my friends in who work in spin glass. Uh, but the uh, there's a a beautiful conjecture, which uh, I guess has been checked a lot numerically, which is that the Nishimori line goes right through this multi-critical point, which separates the paramagnetic, ferromagnetic, and the glassy phase. So, um, so there's a, a particular uh, a point here, uh, which the uh, Nishimori line passes through, um, and uh, and so. So that's uh, so we don't we can't we can understand we don't have the tools to get near this multi-critical point. That's a very challenging problem. But what we do is at low temperatures uh, we're in we're in this region. So the temperatures are low along here. There's this order is fairly low. So we really are working along this this very special line, which is the Nishimori line, where beta is equal to beta bar. This this line is a 45 degree angle. So that is the that is the general picture of what uh, is supposed to happen, and uh, and we um, there's understand. A, there's a question in the chat, and I was going to ask. The sure, same please. Uh, I I'm not monitoring that, so please. Uh, uh, what what happens in higher dimension? Is there any conjecture about that or result? This is three dimensional, and uh, the same thing should happen in higher dimensions. Uh, the same same thing happens. For this is for the XY model, uh, but and one should expect the same thing to happen. Uh, in fact, the, the numerics are much better and much more, uh, much more common uh, for the easing case. But this is the XY case, um, and so uh, yeah. But but the same we expect the same picture in in higher dimensions as well. Absolutely. So let me now just make a few comments about it. This diagram comes from a, 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 is a Monte Carlo simulation. It comes from a paper of Alba and Vicari. Most of it's done, most simulations are done for easing. Um, and the other thing is to mention is that Le Dussault and Harris predict this multi-critical point lies on the Nishimori line. And they, they uh, in 88, they went and computed critical exponents in a six minus epsilon. So that you don't, it's not four minus epsilon, it's six minus epsilon because of, of the presence of the disorder. So that just gives you some, some, uh, some of the references that, uh, that go behind this picture. Okay, uh, so any other comments or questions about the, this, uh, this diagram? Um, So that's uh, it, it, there's a lot of work to be done to to establish uh, most of this diagram. As I said, I'll be talking about what's happening up here is easy. What's happening down here is what we'll discuss. It's all this intermediate range, which we don't know what to do with it yet. So now the next thing is to uh, say what happens in the SU2 case. And here my spins belong to SU2, and the disorder also the SU2 disorder. And these are the random phases in the SU2 case. And we consider the following Gibbs weight. It's, uh, it's really very, uh, very classical. Uh, we put uh, some, some randomness inside uh, here and you have a UJ. This is the adjoint or the inverse of, of UJ, UJ prime. So that if, if this were the identity, we would be talking about a, a standard, uh, uh, a pure system. And, uh, and we have uh, to take the real part of the trace. And this now is gonna be the Haar measure, which, uh, which I mentioned earlier. Now, for any particular disorder, you can check very easily that this is invariant under a right, uh, right action by a, a global SU2 symmetry. So this has a global SU2 symmetry. Uh, it, is not, it is not Heisenberg, uh, however. It is not the usual Heisenberg model. It has a different, um, uh, it lies in a different symmetry class. Yeah. Can I just- Arthur, you have a question about that? No. Uh, 
Yeah, Tyler, I have a short question. It looks like a Higgs model. Is that right? Looks a bit. Yes, and it does indeed. <laughs> okay, uh, it does. And uh, but the pro the point is that these these omegas here are are, are now going to be independent. They're not going to be they're not going to be coupled in the same way. Okay. Yeah, maybe a special case of a Higgs model. Yeah, okay. and and this is don't forget the, in the Higgs model that is an annealed model, and this is a, a quench disorder. Ah, okay, that makes it very different, of course. It makes yeah. it different. Yeah. yeah. Very, Thanks. Very, very useful comment. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, so the, now the disorder uh, is again. This is quench disorder. This is um, going to be that we're going to tell the same story uh, here, uh, which is the disorder is independent for each edge, and uh, and then we will put in here uh, the real part of the trace with this beta bar as before, and we'll just take the trace of this. Um, this matrix and uh and then use the usual har measure uh the nishimori line again corresponds to making this beta identical to this beta bar so we can say nothing if that's not true uh and uh, that is the nishimori disorder so the theorem uh that uh, that we prove again it's all based on this work on on uh, group synchronization that i mentioned at the outset uh, by abe and all uh, and it says that if D is bigger than or equal to three, we have long range order. Um, and uh, so it's very similar to the X, Y case. And the proof is very similar as well. So that's, that is the, uh, uh, that, that basically uh, is what I wanted to say about the results here. Now, let me see how much time I have. Well, I have a fair amount of time. I, I will uh, now go into a little bit of the ideas that are involved in the proof. Uh, some of the elements of the proof um, are uh, uh, disconcern random walk. Um, and uh, so we'll discuss that in a moment. I thought I knew most things about random walk, but, uh, but we'll see that there's some, some interesting features of random walk which uh, enter this uh, problem. So, so uh, but that, let me just discuss some advantages and disadvantages. The advantages are that we don't need translation invariance. The, uh, the randomness or the beta ij's can vary uh, from edge to edge in, in, in any kind of reasonable way, uh, but the disorder has to vary with it. So it, that's, we have to stay on the Nishimori line. Um, and we can look at next to nearest neighbor or other, other cases where reflection positivity doesn't apply. We can also add uh, some random magnetic field and, and the proof will go through it the same way. Um, so those are, those are nice features, um, uh, but there are of course drawbacks. Um, first of all, you can't recover the long range order for the using model in two dimensions. This only works for D bigger than or equal to three. And we don't know how to recover the KT in the presence of disorder. It's probably true, but the proof doesn't work. Uh, for the SU2 case, uh, let me say that long range order uh, only works with the Nishimori, uh, our proof only works with Nishimori disorder. Uh, of course, without the Nishimori disorder, and if you're in a, on a regular lattice, you can prove it with reflection positivity. But the analog of Jurg's comment about, about this work of Messager uh, no longer applies here. So it also doesn't work for the Heisenberg model, the classical Heisenberg model, because the spins have to be group value for this uh, magic of Nishimori to, to work here. Uh, you need the gauge invariance and uh, it's very natural when the spins are, are group value. There may be some, some, some artifact in, in, uh, for, for Heisenberg, but it's not, uh, not at all obvious what it should be. So we're gonna stick to the group value case. So that's, that's the, pretty much the, the, the survey of the results and uh, the advantages and, and drawbacks. Uh, so now, let me see if I can uh, uh, go to Nishimori, what, what it is that Nishimori did and, uh, and it's uh, the gauge invariance in, in the X, we'll, we'll do it in the XY case. Uh, the, uh, the SU2 case is very, very similar. So we consider um, 
just a, a family of functions of, uh, in, uh, in indexed by edges or JJ prime, these are edges of, of my lattice. And we are going to assume that they're, there's just smooth periodic functions. You can just imagine their, their complex value, for example, e to the i u, nice periodic two pi function. And now here is the theorem uh, due to Nishimori in the case of x, y. Yeah, of course, he did it for easing, but the proof works pretty much the same way. Uh, for all beta equal to beta prime, we look at the x, y model, which we discussed a little earlier. Uh, this inner bracket with the angle, with the angular uh, bracket, that represents the average over the spins. And of course, the average will depend upon the disorder, uh, omega. And uh, now, after we take the average, the spin average, we then take the, uh, the disorder average. Uh, with the, these are these uh, rectangular uh, brackets. And of course, that, that, that average has to be taken with beta equal to beta prime. And so the remarkable result uh, says that somehow the phases and the disorder decouple. And this expression is identically equal to uh, a, a product here of independent random variables. So this, this bracket here, I'm just averaging. So I'm just averaging over the disorder, which is a simple uh, independent random variable. So one can compute this explicitly, uh, provided you know what the F is, and we'll know, we'll know what our F is. So that is, the, that is the main content of the Nishimori uh, 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 magic. It's, it, it really only works um, uh, along, the, along the special line. It's, a, it's not it's something that's quite special, but once you have it, it's, it's quite powerful. And as we see, um, this Nishimori line has implications along maybe a, a multi-critical point, which uh, is far away from what we can handle, but, but it, it shows the significance of this particular line. So anyway, let me, let me try to give you a proof. Uh, actually, the proof will almost appear on this slide, not quite, uh, but uh, so, so let, me, let me show you how it goes. Let's take this product here uh, and we take the, again, we take the, uh, the thermal average or the spin average, and then following that, we take the average over the disorder. So here I've written the average of this product with the weights, uh, with the uh, spin, x, y spin, with the disorder present, uh, normal, properly normalized by uh, the partition function. And we integrate over the, uh, over the spin uh, variables, uh, leaving these uh, uh, alone for the moment. If, notice they appear here and they appear in the denominator. And now we take an average over that. So we take the, the average is this average over the, uh, uh, over the disorder with the following weight. So it's just the normalization for the weight. This is just a product measure. So now we average over this. In general, uh, this is a general formula. In general, beta, I've made beta equal to these two betas the same. If I didn't, uh, what I'm gonna say isn't correct. So the betas have to match, that's the Nishimori. So now, now this, is the, this is just the definition. This line is simply the definition of this expression. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna make a little change of variables, very innocent looking change of variables. Uh, we're going to shift theta by phi, and we'll shift the disorder by phi minus phi, phi j prime. So that's just a, a, a trivial uh, change of variables, but it, it, uh, what Nishimori noticed is if you do this, make this change of variables, two things. Of course, your integral doesn't change. You just change variables. It's rotation invariant. Uh, but when I make my change of variables, um, that this is left invariant, this, nothing changes here. These, these, all of these guys just cancel out. The only thing that changes is this factor here. When I've changed the, when I've shifted the, the disorder by this difference. Now, if I shift the disorder by this difference, notice it looks very much like this piece here. It really looks very much the same, except I have phi's instead of thetas. Now the integral is independent of the phi's. 
So then Nishimori said, well, let's just integrate over all the phi's. And what will happen is that after I do this, my partition function down here is canceled with what I have up here exactly. And, and, and that is the magic, the, the, uh, the denominator disappears and then all my averages become extremely simple to compute. So let me say on the next slide, and then I'll maybe go back and maybe it went a little fast. So we, the Gibbs weight is invariant, but this order is shifted. The integral is independent of phi, so we integrate over all the phi's. And miraculously, the partition function uh, is no longer um, there. And we're looking like an anneal system now. And in fact, it's a completely simple integral to compute. The, uh, the remaining integrals factorize and uh, you, can get, you can compute everything exactly. So one corollary of this is if I take the partition function of the, uh, uh, of the system uh, at inverse temperature beta divided by the volume, take the log of the partition function, then I average over the disorder uh, and I take a derivative. This is, a, this is just the expectation of the cosine, uh, which you can compute um, trivially. And notice this is analytic. So uh, all, all along the Nishimori line, this, uh, this, the, this logarithm of the partition function average is uh, analytic. There's no transition. In, in these variables, there's no transition. Nevertheless, there's a phase transition, as I've described, in terms of the spin correlations along, along the Nishimori line. So that's, that is, uh, that is, uh, that is the idea behind uh, uh, Nishimori's uh, proof. So uh, maybe I can just pause to uh, uh, say something. If you have questions, it went a little fast, I realize. But the, the main result, main idea, is you make a change of variables, you notice that the, uh, the spin interaction is not changed, but the weights are changed. But, but I've, after I made this change of variables uh, and then I integrate over them, then this, after I do this integral, that is this partition function, they cancel and then everything becomes uh, uh, very easy to, to compute. It, uh, everything factors and, uh, and that's the reason for this, uh, for, for this uh, identity. So the same thing works uh, you know, in, in the SU2 case, I won't go through that, but it's a, it's a routine uh, exercise once you understand how this works. So are there any comments or, or questions about how this, this goes? It's very simple and beautiful. I beg your pardon? It's simple and beautiful. Yeah, very, it's, it's actually extraordinary. Uh, so, you know, uh, we'll see that when, when Nishimori first uh, uh, submitted this article, um, uh, some of the reviewers thought it wasn't worth publishing. So, uh, but uh, because maybe it was too simple or too special, but of course uh, it, it's been a very influential uh, uh, piece of work. So now, uh, now we're gonna come to some, uh, some interesting uh, work, which I, I found quite uh, surprising about, um, Random walks. Um, so, this uh, we're gonna. I'm gonna, now gonna sketch the proof. Let me see whether I have enough time. Oh yeah, I, I can. I think in ten minutes I can more or less uh, explain the ideas of the proof. So, there. This first uh, part has nothing to do with Nishimori. It has to do with with paths, uh, random paths. So uh, I'm gonna look at a family of paths which go from the origin. To some point n n n far away uh, uh, in my in my lattice, and my paths are going to be uh, formed. Uh, these are kind of upright paths, if you like. They are formed from the unit vectors by just adding them up. So there are lots of such paths which go from here from the origin to this point n n n far apart, and each path has three times n edges, but there are quite a few of them. And uh, so you say, well, okay, that's, that's a nice family of paths, which we're gonna make extensive use of. Now there's a theorem due to Benjamini, P. Mantle in Paris around 98. 
it says that I can put a measure, a probability measure on these paths with the property that the probability that if you take two independent such paths, the probability that they intersect at K edges, so the edges uh, are just uh, the nearest neighbor steps of the path, the probability that they intersect at K edges is exponentially small. So that's, uh, this is a fact which is uh, true in three dimensions. It, it's not true in two dimensions. It's not, you can't prove such a theorem in two dimensions because it's not true. Uh, now you might think, well, look, I'll just take the uniform measure on these paths. That seems to be a nice idea. Trouble is it doesn't work. So, um, so what Benjamini and P. Mandel and Paris did is they found another construction of a random process which has this, uh, this uh, remarkable property, which the uniform measure doesn't have. So these paths are actually, uh, uh, you know, you think of random walk as being the most unpredictable uh, process, but in fact, um, the ones that they construct are more unpredictable. So and in a very precise sense, which I, I won't uh, get into, but uh, the main thing to, to know is that, that if you take two independent such paths, uh, we get something which is, uh, uh, which where the intersections are exponentially suppressed. So that's that's the uh, so that's why all our theorems are are only true in in three or more dimensions, and uh, and nothing works for us in two dimensions. This is a, a problem which uh, which stems back to this very basic um, very basic uh, result of uh, of these authors. So, Tom, can you say anything about what type of uh, distribution is on these paths? Uh, it is a just it, it is a process. It is just it is a, no. I I think I can't. It's not a trivial. It's not a trivial process to construct. Okay. I mean, if you sit down and try and do it, there's also the later work done by uh, by Mosel and, uh, and Hagstrom, and they use a kind of a, of a random drift um uh yeah. to do it but uh, it, it's not not something entirely obvious i would say so i've not been through the proof well enough so that i can give you uh, a very good picture of why this is true but i think it this this picture is quite important uh it's it's quite an important uh, observation that they've made where you think well random walks are the best you can do no that's not true <laughs> in this case it's definitely not true yeah strange yeah. Yeah. that is <laughs> Tom? Oh, baby. Yes. Um, I'm sorry, Reg. Is it possible uh, in higher dimensions? Uh, is does it? Uh, in higher, very good, David. Uh, in higher dimensions, you don't need this lemma. <laughs> you can yeah. use the you can use the random walk. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Absolutely correct. Yeah. Yeah. So it's only it's only needed in three dimensions. We can use the uniform measure on on such paths that will work just fine in four and above, but not in three. Sorry, Reg. Okay. So now we come to the, uh, let's see, yeah, now I think I'm, I'm pretty much on time. And now, once you have this lemma, um, there's a, the proof really can be done in a couple of slides. Um, so uh, again, we're following uh, this group synchronization uh, uh, work of, of, of Abe et al. And we look at uh, the product of these uh, factors along a path which goes from zero to n. So when you just take this product and look at, just take the, just take the product along the edges of the path. And when we're doing it in a non-abelian case, it has to be done in order, but here it doesn't even matter. And when, of course, if I take a path that goes from zero to n, these are nearest neighbor paths uh, and uh, of the type we just described. And, and of course, when you do that, you get a, a telescopic uh, product or telescopic sum, and you get this, the, the, uh, the spin or the phase at the origin and the, space, the phase at the site n far away. Of course, in addition to that, we get all these factors along the path of the disorder. These are all the disorder factors that appear here, which I've lumped into this uh, RP uh, omega. 
So now the problem will be to somehow decouple this RP omega from, from this expression. And uh, so, so here's, here's where Nishimori comes in, uh, the Nishimori gauge invariance, which I was explaining a little while ago. When you take the expectation, you take first take the, 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 uh, the spin expectation, then the disorder expectation of this expression. These are exactly of the form F theta i minus theta j with the omega ij's. It's exactly the same form. It just factors and you get a product of, of, uh, of independent random variables, which by definition I've called lambda of beta uh, uh, raised to the three to the nth power. Why three to the n? Because each path has three to the n edges in it. So it's a very simple uh, computation to do. You can compute for beta large. You can see this is around one, a little less than one. So now what we'll do and, uh, is to take this, uh, this R of P and we'll normalize it so that the product has average value one. So, so now you can start to see where I'm going because if I can get rid of this guy uh, through Schwartz inequality or something, uh, which is exactly what I'm going to do. Uh, and then we'll be able to get the, the spin spin correlation is one. So this hat just means I've normalized the, uh, the product of the phases along the path with a, with a uniform factor, just a simple uniform factor. And, uh, and now this is a very crucial step here, which is that in addition to, uh, to averaging over the disorder, I'm averaging over the paths. These are the, this is the path weight that, uh, uh, that uh, Benjamini and all uh, did. This is the measure on these, uh, these paths, which has very special properties, which we discussed. So, so this, is, this is an uh, a tautology. This is a, a purely an identity. And so uh, since this factor is uh, one, bounded by one, our problem is to show that this expression, its expectation, uh, by the Schwartz inequality is going to be small. And that's, that's the whole story. So we'll look at the difference between these two. We'll Schwartz it from away from here to try to get it. Uh, we want to show this quantity small compared to one, and then we're going to be done. And now this expectation is equal to this expression here. And, and now that doesn't look quite right but it's correct because the average of, the, uh, of, the, of this guy is one. And so this is correct. So now all I have to do is to compute this uh, average, uh, which is actually uh, a fairly simple calculation uh, using the, uh, the properties of M and, um, uh, and, and the properties of the, of the paths and the disorder. And we'll see that this is very small. So here, here's the rest of it. So, so, that, so this is really, at this point, you can sit down and say, yeah, I can prove the rest of it. Uh, so, so this is really where everything lies. Uh, you have to compute this average, which is after all, we're looking at, at paths uh, uh, and we're looking at independent random variables um, or two copies because of that of a square, but it's a relatively straightforward uh, exercise from now on, but I will do it for you just for completeness. And um, so first we use the fact that this lambda inverse times the expectation is one. That's, that's by definition of the lambda inverse. So now when I compute the variance, I have to multiply the r hat by r hat times this adjoint. So here are my factors of lambda and one in here, I have a plus i, and here I have the minus i because I have to take the adjoint. Now, if the paths, if these paths p1, p2 never crossed, they never crossed at all, we would get one because these factors would not, these are independent random variables. And if their edges never cross, we just get a factor of one every time we do it. So, so that's, that's one important observation that if the paths don't cross, then uh, this expectation is by definition one because we've normalized it properly. However, of course we'll have, uh, you know, paths can, uh, can share edges. And for every time we have a common edge, these factors, these phase factors cancel out. 
and you are left with a factor of, of lambda to the minus two, which is e to the beta. So that's why it's important to understand what happens when you have uh, a large number of intersections. And so now you can write this expression in terms of uh, the probability that there are, they have k common edges with respect to this measure. And uh, so first what you do is you say, well, let's ignore this, these, phase, these, these weights lambda to the minus k and the sum of pk's is one. So that's, that's where the one comes from. And then we just have to, to analyze the rest of this, uh, uh, of this factor, which is pk times, the, uh, times some small exponential weight. Notice that beta appears here, and uh, this is something that grows. But on the other hand, this is something that decays. And so if you've chosen your beta right, and you use the fact that this is a probability weight, you're essentially finished. So I will um, just finish up here. You have to break the sum up into two pieces. And it's uh, a routine exercise to uh, see that uh, this is what you get. Uh, and, but here is where, when k is large, we simply use uh, the fact that, um, that we use this result of uh, on these unpredictable paths. Um, and so beta must be smaller than the C naught that appeared in the work of, of uh, uh, Benjamini, uh, Mendel, and, and Paris. So, uh, so that's that really basically is the entire uh, proof. Uh, the only thing I really haven't shown you is I didn't prove the, their theorem about the random paths, but um, but uh, but it's a uh, uh, I find it quite a uh, an amazing uh, set of ideas. Uh, and I which should say that most of these ideas are are, are already in this. Uh, a paper uh, on the synchronization on, on grids. So, um, so the similar proof works in the SUN case. Um, and, uh, and so we just take the YP, we take a product of these unitaries along a path. We must be careful to order the paths. And uh, there's a telescopic sum. And, uh, and we have this, this is like the analog of the RP. That I had in the last case, and uh, and everything works pretty much the same way. Um, I see my my laptop is running low on battery, so I have to charge it here. Um, so so everything pretty much works the same way as it did in the Abelian case. So I I, uh, I I won't try to do anything with that. Okay, so now I'm at the very. This is my last slide. Um, these are some concluding remarks. Um, as I mentioned, uh, according to one talk I saw of Nishimori's, uh, one of the referees wrote this model is too artificial and thin to warrant publication. Now we see that you know referees aren't always right. Uh, I'm sure this was a well-meaning referee, but he certainly got this one wrong. Uh, there is interesting work on uh, on dynamics uh, along the Nishimori line. Um, and uh, this, this author Ozeki in 95, so there's no aging, there's no growth of time correlations. So this is another indication that the Nishimori line does not enter the spin glass phase where you expect aging to occur. In a very recent uh, preprint, uh, Nishimori showed that you could add a gauge invariant disorder and still keep analyticity. It must be small. He did it for the easing case. I'm sure it could be easily extended to the XY case as well. So now your now your order is no longer your disorder is no longer uncorrelated, no longer independent, uh, but you can still um, uh, prove some results along these lines. So uh, finally, let me mention that there's a lot of work uh, which I really don't understand so well um, related to the Nishimori line and Bayesian statistics and uh, what's called error correcting codes. Uh, here are some references. Uh, I remember uh, Nicholas Surles telling me about this years ago and being very interested, but not really understanding the details. This is usually uh, in the context of icing, uh, this icing spin model and, and spin glasses, uh, but, uh, but the Nishimori line appears here as well. There's a connection with uh, 
supersymmetric models. Uh, David Grusberg, Ludwig Reed, uh, for the easing model in two dimensions. Um, and there's a, a network model, uh, the Mertz and Chalker, which is um, a little bit more recent. And uh, this uses the fact that the easing model, uh, the nearest neighbor easing model with this order is still free fermions. And so this is used to do numerical simulations and also to do some theoretical studies uh, of, of the particular case of the easing model with bond disorder. So I see my time is up and, uh, and I've stopped pretty much uh, on time, but I uh, thank you for your attention. And of course, I welcome any questions or comments. Well, thank you, Tom, for a really beautiful talk. You explained these wonderful ideas and used them, and it's uh, very nice to see it all put together. I wonder, is there a similar theory on graphs rather than on lattices? Yeah, absolutely. The same thing will work on graphs. Yes. Yeah, I believe so. The main thing you have to do on graphs, I mean, the Nishimori line works on graphs. Uh, exactly the same way. Um, uh, you need, if you're going to do a, a graph, then you need to go back and you need to check this work uh, about these random walks on graphs. That's that's what's important. As long as the random walk uh, uh, problems are, are work, in other words, as long as two random paths don't, um, uh, as long as you can set it up, so the edges are unlikely to intersect, uh, then I think the same the same things can be done in in uh, in general uh, on fairly general graphs. They they need to have some kind of three dimensional structure, of course. Otherwise, that from branching at a certain rate. Yeah, yeah. So the, uh, I hope when people comment that you'll turn on your video so we can see you and uh, let's have a great deal of discussion about this interesting talk. Hello, Professor Thomas Spencer and Jeffy. Hello. So I, I was wondering if, have you, have you attempted to make the continuum limit of your models? No, we haven't thought about that uh, it would be interesting to do. It might be uh, it might be uh, it might be challenging to do that. But uh, uh, most models that I know uh, with this order present are are put on the lattice. I guess uh, I guess one thing you could try the natural place to try to do this would be for the uh, easing model in two dimensions, where one knows quite a lot about what happens and. Uh, but as far as I know, uh, it, it hasn't been done. Uh, and um, so the easing model with disorder, uh, with bond disorder, uh, which is what we're talking about here, is, uh, is of course quite a rich and complicated area. It, it, it touches on the spin glass only occurs at zero temperature. And uh, uh, so there's a, there's a lot, um, uh, but we don't understand much of that diagram we would love to understand in two dimensions. We have a, a, a fairly poor understanding of it, in spite of the fact that it is just free fermions. Uh, but there, but the free freeness is a, is a bit misleading. You had disorder, so it's really equivalent to understanding a, a, a large random matrix uh, with uh, in, in this model. So it's and that. That is perhaps a, a, a nice way to think about these problems in two dimensions. I see. Thank you. Uh, just one other one another thing. So you sure. are you working on the Euclidean Euclidean space, not just not the Minkowski space time? Yeah, we're always on Euclidean. We're, this is all in the Euclidean theory. I would be. I have no. I have no ideas. I didn't think about what happens in the Minkowski world. Um, it's a, a. It's always interesting to think about that. You can formulate things in the Minkowski world, even on the lattice. You just have to do some kind of analytic continuation, 
and then uh, and then I, I don't know, uh, you know, I've never seen papers where one, one does scattering or that kind of thing, which is more natural in the Minkowski world. You can do it. You can do scattering type uh, uh, on the lattice, uh, but um, uh, but that's of course uh, you have to do some kind of analytic continuation. And then I really don't know what happens, you know, in the presence of disorder. It's a question worth worth thinking about. I think. I think the key property we have to establish the reflection positivity, and I think that has been established by Professor Jeffy, I guess. Well, the, the problem is that, uh, that reflection positivity uh, will, will have some problems in this context once you have this order. You can't prove phase transitions if, you, if your JIJs are, 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 uh, are, not, um, are, are not, not translation invariant. Uh, oh, it simply see. doesn't work. Um, so there's a, there's a, that's one of the advantages of this particular formulation, we don't care much about if the JIJs or the beta IJs move around as long as the disorder matches uh, what, what, what they feel it does. So it's, um, yeah, it doesn't care. Thank you. Tom? Yeah, hi, David. Um, do you think that there's a duality on the Nishimori line? Um, so what kind of duality? I would, uh, so, you know, we're not using any kind of duality. Of course, um, the, the uh, I suppose, uh, you maybe are referring to the XY case, uh, as opposed to the SU2? Well, actually, um, yes and no, in that, uh, we, we now have two proofs of long range, uh, order in the or phase transition i guess uh in in the uh, abelian case right. in and one of them uses duality and the other one doesn't yes so i'm just wondering uh if there is a dual to the i issue. i have not uh thought about that i mean duality we've all of course we we use duality quite a bit and the the work that uh for example uh, Alan Guth did a long time ago in the abelian cases uh, is using Fourier transform, which is a form of duality. And um, but uh, um, uh, yeah, I, I uh, th these dual dual models. I, I would like to know how to do it in a non-abelian context. I, I'm I'm familiar okay. with duality more in the context of of abelian things because then I can use Fourier transform. But is that more or less, are you using kind of a Fourier transform, David, or are you using something else? Uh, well, I was thinking more of the, uh, it is duality, but it's just expressed the way Kennedy King did in that proof. Oh, Kennedy uh, King is very, uh, probably quite close to what we're doing. That's what I thought. And so I was wondering if there's a hint from your non-abelian version. Yeah. Uh, no, yeah. I don't know. I mean, Kennedy King is quite, is quite uh, similar. Uh, except they don't do a non-abelian case, as far as I know. Um, but uh, and then the other point to make about Kennedy King is that their disorder is not uh, is uh, uh, is annealed. It's not. Uh, it's it, it's really they're coupling it to a Higgs uh, model, and in our case, it's really a disordered case. And yeah, the, right. it's it's a different it's a different setup. But there are some similarities, and it would be useful to explore it. Um, yeah, which which we haven't done. I have to say, we've recognized uh, that there's some nice similarities there. Uh, Roland pointed this out to us, and uh, and and I certainly agree that there are uh, parallels there, and uh, it's, they're worth thinking about. So, Tom, this is the picture language seminar. So maybe there's. Picture Fourier transform related that gives that you that would be lovely. I would love to be able to find that. Yeah, no, <laughs> I'm sorry, Arthur, I didn't have any pictures except for this one phase diagram. Oh, no, but this, this yeah, that's the nature of this talk. central connection to the pictures. <laughs> yeah, that would be very good. That would be very good. And also, you know, I know Arthur's very interested in the quantum versions of these things. I would be extremely interested in, in it too. Uh, there are, um, you know, problems about quantum information recovering signals from noisy information. 
uh, and uh, and so um, uh, yeah, I, I I would love to know something about that. So if somebody in the audience has some uh, some comment about that, I'd be extremely interested to hear it. I see Jörg is here. Maybe he has something to say. No, <laughs> it was a very interesting talk. One might mention that for the easing model, there are, of course, adaptations of the Pyle's argument to the disorder case, which gives yes. fairly optimal results. Yes, and two dimensions, I guess that works pretty well, and, and probably in and three dimensions too. Three dimension two, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, of course. Uh, yeah, that, that's why, of course, I focused on the, uh, on the continuous symmetry where, uh, where it's really uh, a bit different situation. Uh, Powell's arguments don't don't work very well when you have continuous symmetry. Yeah. Right. So, are there any other questions or comments? Well, if not, then I really thank you again, Tom, for a wonderful talk. And uh, we look forward to our next seminar. We're going to take a break for a week for spring break, and we'll be back in two weeks. Bye-bye. See you then. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>